few texts have been the occasion for the spilling of more ink than Matthew 16 17-19. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. For Catholics, this text is clear. All twelve apostles were present, yet Jesus promised to give to Peter alone the keys of the kingdom, symbolizing the authority of Christ the authority of heaven over the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is the church. Yet millions of Protestants believe that there is a distinction in meaning in the Greek text between the two rocks that would eliminate Peter from consideration for being the rack. Thou art Petros and upon this Petra I will build my church. Dot, dot, the first rock, Petros, is claimed to refer to a small, insignificant rock, Peter. The second, Petra, is claimed to mean a massive boulder, that would be either Jesus or Peter's confession of faith. The argument concludes Jesus did not build his church upon St. Peter but either upon himself or Peter's faith. Below are seven reasons, among many others we could examine, why Peter is undeniably the rock. 1. Matthew, we have pretty solid evidence, was originally written in Aramaic. Both streets. Papias and Irenaeus tell us as much in the second century. But even more importantly and more certainly Jesus would not have spoken his discourse of Matthew 16 in Greek. Greek was the dominant language of the Roman Empire in the first century, but most of the common Jewish folk to whom Jesus spoke would not have been fluent in it. Aramaic was their spoken language. Moreover, we have biblical evidence John 1.40 to that also points to Jesus using Aramaic in the naming of Peter. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The name Cephas is an anglicized form of the Aramaic Kepha, which means simply rack. There would have been no small rack to be found in Jesus' original statement to Peter. Even well-respected Protestant scholars will agree on this point. Baptist scholar D.A. Carson, were eyes, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, T, he underlying Aramaic is in this case unquestionable, and most probably Kepha was used in both clauses, you were Kepha, and, on this Kepha, since the word was used both for a name and for a, rack. The Peshitta, written in Syriac, a language cognate with a dialect of Aramaic, makes no distinction between the words in the two clauses. 2, in Koine Greek, the dialect of Greek used by the authors of the New Testament, Petros and Petra are masculine and feminine forms of words with the same root and the same definition rack. There is no small rack to be found in the Greek text, either. So why did St. Matthew use these two words in the same verse? Petra was a common word used for rack in Greek. It is used 15 times to mean rock, rocks, or rocky in the New Testament. Petros is an ancient Greek term that was not commonly used in Koine Greek at all. In fact, it was never used in the New Testament, except for Peter's name after Jesus changed it from Simon to Peter. It follows that when St. Matthew was translating, he would have used Petra for rack. However, in so doing, he would have encountered a problem. Petra is a feminine noun. It would have been improper to call Peter Petra. This would be equivalent to calling a male Valerie or Priscilla in English. Hence. Petros was used instead of Petra for Peter's name. 3. There are several words the inspired author could have used for rock or stone in Greek. Petra and Lathos were the most common. They could be used interchangeably. A connotation of large or small with either of them would depend on context. The words simply meant rock or stone. Craig S. Keener, another Protestant scholar, on page 90 of the I've Bible background commentary of the New Testament, states, in Greek, here, they, referring to Petros and Petra, are cognate terms that were used interchangeably by this period. D.A. Carson points out the big-slash-small distinction did exist in Greek, but is found only in ancient Greek, 
used from the 8th to the 4th century BC, and even there it is mostly confined to poetry. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek, used from the 4th century BC to the 5th century AD. Carson agrees with Keener and with Catholics that there is no distinction and definition between Petros and Petra. One of the most respected and referenced Greek dictionaries among evangelicals is Gerhard Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In a most candid statement about Matthew 16-18, Dr. Oscar Cullman, a contributing editor to this work, writes, The obvious pun which has made its way into the Greek text, dot, dot, suggests a material identity between Petra and Petros. Dot, dot, as it is impossible to differentiate strictly between the two words. Dot, 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 Petros himself is this Petra, not just his faith or his confession. Dot, 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 the idea of the reformers that he is referring to the faith of Peter is quite inconceivable. Dot, 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 for there is no reference here to the faith of Peter. Rather, the parallelism of thou art rock and on this rock I will build shows that the second rock can only be the same as the first. It is thus evident that Jesus is referring to Peter, to whom he has given the name rock. Dot, 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 to this extent Roman Catholic exegesis is right and all Protestant attempts to evade this interpretation are to be rejected. For, if St. Matthew wanted to distinguish racks in the text, he would have most likely used lithos. As stated above, lithos could refer to a large rock, but it was more commonly used to denote a small stone. However, there is a third word St. Matthew could have used that always means small stone, Sophos. It is used twice in Reverend 2.17 as small stone when Jesus says, To him who conquers I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, with a new name written on the stone which no one knows except him who receives it. Here we have one Greek word that unlike Lithos and Petra always has a connotation of small stone, or pebble. 5. A simpler line of reasoning gets away from original languages and examines the immediate context of the passage. Notice, our Lord says to St. Peter in Matthew 16 17-19, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus uses the second person personal seven times in just three verses. The context is clearly one of Jesus communicating a unique authority to Peter. Further, Jesus is portrayed as the builder of the church, not the building. He said, I will build my church. Jesus is the wise man who built his house upon the rock, Matt. 7.24, in Matthew's Gospel. Once again, it just does not fit the context to have Jesus building the church upon himself. He is building it upon Peter. 6. A lot of folks miss the significance of Simon's name changed to Peter. When God revealed to certain of his people a new and radical calling in scripture, he sometimes changed their names. In particular, we find this in the calling of the patriarchs. Abraham, exalted father in Hebrew, was changed to Abraham, father of the multitudes. Jacob, supplanter, to Israel, one who prevails with God. In fact, there is a very interesting parallel here between Abraham and Saint Peter. In Isaiah 51, 1-2, we read. Hearken to me, you who pursue deliverance, you who seek the Lord, look to the rack from which you were hewn. Dot, 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 look to Abraham your father. Jesus here makes Saint Peter a true father over the household of faith, just as God made Abraham our true father in the faith, cf. Romans 4, 1-18, James 2-21. Hence, it is fitting that Peter's successors are called Pope or Papa, as was Abraham, cf. Luke 16 24. 7. When we understand that Christ is the true son of David who came to restore the prophetic kingdom of David, we understand that Christ in Matthew 16, like the King of Israel, was establishing a prime minister among his ministers the apostles in the kingdom.
Isaiah 22 15-22 gives us insight into the ministry of the Prime Minister in ancient Israel. Thus says the Lord God of hosts, Come, go to the steward, to Shebna, who is over the household, and say to him, dot, dot, Behold the Lord will hurl you away violently. Dot, 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 I will thrust you from your office, and you will be cast down from your station. In that day I will call my servant Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe, and will bind your girdle on him, and will commit your authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David, he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. In Revelation 1.18, Jesus declares, I have the keys of death and Hades. He then quotes this very text from Isaiah in Revelation 3, 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, The words of the Holy One, the True One, who has the key of David, who opens and no one shall shut, who shuts and no one opens. No Christian would deny Jesus as the king who possesses the keys. Who does he give the keys to? Peter. One of the points I try to emphasize when giving a seminar is that you can begin to be an effective apologist right away, you don't have to wait until you become a theological whiz. Just work with what you know, even if it is only one fact. I illustrate this from my own experience, and you can use this technique the next time you have verses thrown at you by an anti-Catholic. Some years ago, before I took a real interest in reading the Bible, I tried to avoid missionaries who came to the door. I had been burned too often. Why open the door, or why prolong the conversation, if they caught me outside the house, when I had nothing to say? Sure, I had a Bible. I used it perhaps the way you use yours today, to catch dust that otherwise would gather on the top shelf of the bookcase. It was one of those, family, Bibles, crammed with beautiful color plates and so heavy that my son didn't outweigh it until he turned five. As I said, I had a Bible, but I didn't turn to it much, so I had little to say about the Bible when missionaries cornered me. I didn't know to which verses I should refer when explaining the Catholic position. For a layman, I suppose I was reasonably well informed about my faith at least I never doubted it or ceased to practice it but my own reading had not equipped me for verbal duels. Then, one day, I came across a nugget of information that sent a shockwave through the next missionary who rang the bell and that proved to me that becoming skilled in apologetics isn't really all that difficult. Here is what happened. When I answered the door, the lone missionary introduced himself as a Seventh-day Adventist. He asked if he could, share with me some insights from the Bible. I told him to go ahead. He flipped from one page to another, quoting this verse and that, trying to demonstrate the errors of the Church of Rome and the manifest truth of his own denomination as position. Not much to say. Some of the verses I had encountered before. I wasn't entirely illiterate with respect to the Bible, but many verses were new to me. Whether familiar or not, the verses elicited no response from me, because I didn't know enough about the Bible to respond effectively. Finally the missionary got to Matthew 16, 18. You were Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Hold it right there. I said. I know that verse. That is where Jesus appointed Simon the earthly head of the church. That is where he appointed him the first pope. I paused and smiled broadly knowing what the missionary would say in response. I knew he usually didn't get any defense of the Catholic position at all as he went door to door, but sometimes a Catholic would speak up as I had. He had a reply, and I knew what it would be, and I was ready for it. I understand your thinking, he said. But you Catholics misunderstand this verse because you don't know any Greek. That is the trouble with your church and with your scholars. You people don't you know the language in which the New Testament was written. To understand Matthew 16 18, we have to get behind the English to the Greek. Is that so? I said, leading him on. I pretended to be ignorant of the trap being laid for me. Yes, he said. In Greek, the word for rock is Petra, which means large, massive stone. 
The word used for Simon S. new name is different, it is Petros, which means a little stone, a pebble. In reality, what the missionary was telling me at this point was false. As Greek scholars even non-Catholic ones admit, the words Petros and Petra were synonyms in first century Greek. They meant, small stone, and, large rock, in some ancient Greek poetry, centuries before the time of Christ, but the distinction had disappeared from the language by the time Matthew's Gospel was rendered in Greek. The difference in meaning can only be found in Attic Greek, but the New Testament was written in Koine Greek an entirely different dialect. In Koine Greek, both Petros and Petra simply meant, rack. If Jesus had wanted to call Simon a small stone, the Greek lithos would have been used. The missionary's argument didn't work and showed a faulty knowledge of Greek. For an evangelical Protestant Greek scholar's admission of this, C.G.A. Carson, the expositor's Bible commentary, Grand Rapids, Zondervan, 1984, Frankie K. Belen, ed. 8, 368. You Catholics, the missionary continued. Because you don't know Greek, imagine that Jesus was equating Simon and the rock. Actually, of course, it was just the opposite. He was contrasting them. On the one side, the rack on which the church would be built, Jesus himself, on the other, this mere pebble. Jesus was really saying that he himself would be the foundation, and he was emphasizing that Simon wasn't remotely qualified to be it. Case closed, he thought. It was the missionary's turn to pause and smile broadly. He had followed the training he had been given. He had been told that a rare Catholic might have heard of Matthew 16:18 and might argue that it proved the establishment of the papacy. He knew what he was supposed to say to prove otherwise, and he had said it. Well, I replied, beginning to use that nugget of information I had come across. I agree with you that we must get behind the English to the Greek. He smiled some more and nodded. But I am sure you all agree with me that we must get behind the Greek to the Aramaic. The what? He asked. The Aramaic, I said. As you know. Aramaic was the language Jesus and the Apostles and all the Jews in Palestine spoke. It was the common language of the place. I thought Greek was. No, I answered. Many, if not most of them, knew Greek, of course, because Greek was the lingua franca of the Mediterranean world. It was the language of culture and commerce, and most of the books of the New Testament were written in it because they were written not just for Christians in Palestine but also for Christians in places such as Rome, Alexandria, and Antioch, places where Aramaic was the spoken language. I say most of the New Testament was written in Greek, but not all. Many hold that Matthew was written in Aramaic we know this from records kept by Eusebius of Caesarea but it was translated into Greek early on, perhaps by Matthew himself. In any case the Aramaic original is lost, as are all the originals of the New Testament books, so all we have today is the Greek. I stopped for a moment and looked at the missionary. He seemed a bit uncomfortable, perhaps doubting that I was a Catholic because I seemed to know what I was talking about. I continued. Aramaic in the New Testament. We know that Jesus spoke Aramaic because some of his words are preserved for us in the Gospels. Look at Matthew 27, 46, where he says from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That isn't T Greek, it is Aramaic, and it means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What is more, I said, in Paul's epistles four times in Galatians and four times in 1 Corinthians we have the Aramaic form of Simon's new name preserved for us. In our English Bibles it comes out as Cephas. That isn't T Greek. That is a transliteration of the Aramaic word Kepha, rendered as Kephas in its Hellenistic form. And what does Kepha mean? It means a rock, the same as Petra. It don't he mean a little stone or a pebble. What Jesus said to Simon in Matthew 16:18 was this, You are Kepha, and on this Kepha I will build my church. When you understand what the Aramaic says, you see that Jesus was equating Simon and the rock, he wasn't he contrasting them. 
We see this vividly in some modern English translations, which render the verse this way, You were rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. In French one word, Pierre, has always been used both for Simon's new name and for the rack. For a few moments the missionary seemed stumped. It was obvious he had never heard such a rejoinder. His brow was neat in thought as he tried to come up with a counter. Then it occurred to him. Wait a second, he said. If Kefa means the same as Petra, why don't we read in the Greek, you were Petra, and on this Petra I will build my church. Why, for Simon's new name, does Matthew use a Greek word, Petros, which means something quite different from Petra? Because he had no choice, I said. Greek and Aramaic have different grammatical structures. In Aramaic you can use Kepha in both places in Matthew 16 18. In Greek you encounter a problem arising from the fact that nouns take differing gender endings. You have masculine, feminine, and neuter nouns. The Greek word Petra is feminine. You can use it in the second half of Matthew 16 18 without any trouble. But you can t use it as Simon's new name, because you can t give a man a feminine name at least back then you couldn't t. You have to change the ending of the noun to make it masculine. When you do that, you get Petros, which was an already existing word meaning rock. I admit that it's an imperfect rendering of the Aramaic, you lose part of the play on words. In English, where we have Peter and rock, you lose all of it. But that is the best you can do in Greek. Beyond the grammatical evidence, the structure of the narrative does not allow for a downplaying of Peter's role in the church. Look at the way Matthew 16 15-19 is structured. After Peter gives a confession about the identity of Jesus, the Lord does the same in return for Peter. Jesus does not say, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are an insignificant pebble and on this rock I will build my church. Dot, 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 I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is giving Peter a threefold blessing, including the gift of the keys to the kingdom, not undermining his authority. To say that Jesus is downplaying Peter flies in the face of the context. Jesus is installing Peter as a form of chief steward or a prime minister under the king of kings by giving him the keys to the kingdom. As can be seen in Isaiah 22 22, kings in the Old Testament appointed a chief steward to serve under them in a position of great authority to rule over the inhabitants of the kingdom. Jesus quotes almost verbatim from this passage in Isaiah, and so it is clear what he has in mind. He is raising Peter up as a father figure to the household of faith, is 22-21, to lead them and guide the flock, John 21-15-17. This authority of the Prime Minister under the King was passed on from one man to another down through the ages by the giving of the keys, which were worn on the shoulder as a sign of authority. Likewise, the authority of Peter has been passed down for 2,000 years by means of the papacy. My turn to pause. I stopped and smiled. The missionary smiled back uncomfortably, but said nothing. We exchanged smiles for about 30 seconds. Then he looked at his watch, noticed how time had flown, and excused himself. I never saw him again. So what came of this encounter? Two things one for me, one for him. I began to develop a sense of confidence. I began to see that I could defend my faith if I engaged in a little homework. The more homework, the better the defense. I realized that any literate Catholic including you could do the same. You don't have to suspect your faith might be untrue when you can t come up with an answer to a pointed question. Once you develop a sense of confidence, you can say to yourself, I may not know the answer to that, but I know I could find the answer if I hit the books. The answer is there, if only I spend the time to look for it. And what about the missionary? Did he go away with anything? I think so. I think he went away with a doubt regarding his understanding, or lack of understanding, of Catholics and the Catholic faith. I hope his doubt has since matured into a sense that maybe, just maybe, Catholics have something to say on behalf of the religion and that he should look more carefully into the faith he once so confidently opposed.
The New Testament contains five different metaphors for the foundation of the church, Matt. 16-18, 1 Cor. 3-11, F. 2-20, 1 Pet. 2-5-6, Reverend 21-14. One metaphor that has been disputed is Jesus Christ as calling the Apostle Peter, Rock. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Matt. 1618. Some have tried to argue that Jesus did not mean that his church would be built on Peter but on something else. Some argue that in this passage there is a minor difference between the Greek term for Peter, Petros, and the term for rock, Petra, yet they ignore the obvious explanation, Petra, a feminine noun, has simply been modified to have a masculine ending, since one would not refer to a man, Peter, as feminine. The change in the gender is purely for stylistic reasons. These critics also neglect the fact that Jesus spoke Aramaic, and, as John 1.42 tells us, in everyday life he actually referred to Peter as Kepha or Cephas, depending on how it is transliterated. It is the term which is then translated into Greek as Petros. Thus, what Jesus actually said to Peter in Aramaic was, you were Kepha and on this very Kepha I will build my church. The Church Fathers, those Christians closest to the Apostles in time, culture, and theological background, clearly understood that Jesus promised to build the church on Peter, as the following passages show. Tation the Syrian Simon Cephas answered and said, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto thee also, that you are Cephas, and on this rock will I build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The Diatessar on 23, A.D. 170. Tertullian. Was anything withheld from the knowledge of Peter, who is called the rock on which the church would be built, Matt? 1618, with the power of loosing and binding in heaven and on earth, Matt. 1619. Demar against the Heretics 22, A.D. 200. T. He Lord said to Peter, On this rock I will build my church, I have given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and, whatever you shall have bound or loosed on earth will be bound or loosed in heaven, Matt. 161819. Dot, dot. Dot, what kind of man are you, subverting and changing what was the manifest intent of the Lord when he conferred this personally upon Peter? Upon you, he says, I will build my church, and I will give to you the keys. Modesty 21, 9, 10, A.D. 220 The Letter of Clement to James Be it known to you, my Lord, that Simon, Peter, who, for the sake of the true faith, and the most sure foundation of his doctrine, was set apart to be the foundation of the church, and for this end was by Jesus himself, with his truthful mouth, named Peter. Letter of Clement to James 2, A.D. 221 The Clementine Homilies Simon Peter said to Simon Magus in Rome, For you now stand in direct opposition to me, who am a firm rock, the foundation of the church, Matt. 1618. Clementine Homilies 1719, A.D. 221. Origen. Look at, Peter, the great foundation of the church, that most solid of rocks, upon whom Christ built the church, Matt. 1618. And what does our Lord say to him? Oh you have little faith, he says, why do you doubt? Matt. 1431. Homilies on Exodus 5, 4, A.D., 248. Cyprian of Carthage. The Lord says to Peter, I say to you, he says, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Dot, dot, Matt. 16, 18, 19. On him, Peter, he builds the church and to him he gives the command to feed the sheep, John 21:17. and although he assigns a like power to all the apostles, 
yet he founded a single chair, cathedra, and he established by his own authority a source and an intrinsic reason for that unity. Indeed, the others were that also which Peter was, that is, apostles, but a primacy is given to Peter, whereby it is made clear that there is but one church and one chair. Dot, dot, dot. If someone does not hold fast to this unity of Peter, can he imagine that he still holds the faith? If he, should, desert the chair of Peter upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident that he is in the church? The unity of the Catholic Church for, first edition, A.D. 251. There is one God and one Christ, and one church, and one chair founded on Peter by the word of the Lord. It is not possible to set up another altar or for there to be another priesthood besides that one altar and that one priesthood. Whoever was gathered elsewhere is scattering. Letters 43, 40, 5, AD, 253. There, John 6, 68, 69, speaks Peter, upon whom the church would be built, teaching in the name of the church and showing that even if a stubborn and proud multitude withdraws because it does not wish to obey, yet the church does not withdraw from Christ. The people joined to the priest and the flock clinging to their shepherd are the church. You ought to know, then, that the bishop is in the church and the church in the bishop, and if someone is not with the bishop, he is not in the church. They vainly flatter themselves who creep up, not having peace with the priests of God, believing that they are secretly, that is, invisibly, in communion with certain individuals. For the church, which is one and Catholic, is not split nor divided, but it is indeed united and joined by the cement of priests who adhere one to another. Ibid. 66, 69, 8. Vermilion. But what is his error? Dot, dot, who does not remain on the foundation of the one church which was founded upon the rock by Christ, Matt. 16 to 18, can be learned from this, which Christ said to Peter alone, whatever things you shall bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth, they shall be loosed in heaven, Matt. 16 19. Collected in Cyprian S. Letters 74, 75, 16, A.D. 253. Pope, Stephen, I. Dot, dot, boasts of the place of his episcopate and contends that he holds the succession from Peter, on whom the foundations of the church were laid, Matt. 16 18. Dot, 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 Pope, Stephen. Dot, dot, announces that he holds by succession the throne of Peter. Ibid. 74, 75, 17. Ephraim the Syrian. Jesus said, Simon, my follower, I have made you the foundation of the Holy Church. I bet I'm called you Peter, because you will support all its buildings. You are the inspector of those who will build on earth the church for me. If they should wish to build what is false, you, the foundation, will condemn them. You are the head of the fountain from which my teaching flows, you are the chief of my disciples. Homilies 4, 1, A.D. 351. Optatus. You cannot deny that you are aware that in the city of Rome the episcopal chair was given first to Peter, the chair in which Peter sat, the same who was head that is why he is also called Cephas, rock, of all the apostles, the one chair in which unity is maintained by all. The schism of the Donatus 2, 2, A.D. 367. Ambrose of Milan. Christ, made answer, you were Peter, and upon this rock will I build my church. Dot, 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 could he not, then, strengthen the faith of the man to whom, acting on his own authority, he gave the kingdom, whom he called the rock, thereby declaring him to be the foundation of the church, Matt. 16 18. The Faith 4, 5, A.D. 379. It is to Peter that he says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, Matt. 16 18. Where Peter is, there is the church. And where the church is, no death is there, but life eternal. Commentary on 12 Psalms of David 40, 30, A.D. 389. Pope Damasus I. Likewise it is decreed. Dot, 
dot, that it ought to be announced that, dot, dot, the Holy Roman Church has not been placed at the forefront of the churches by the conciliar decisions of other churches, but has received the primacy by the evangelic voice of our Lord and Savior, who says, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Dot, 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 Matt. 16, 18, 19. The first C, therefore, is that of Peter the Apostle, that of the Roman Church, which has neither stain nor blemish nor anything like it. Decree of Damasus 3, A.D. 382. Jerome. But, you, Jovinian, will say, it was on Peter that the church was founded, Matt. 16 A.D. Well. Dot, dot, one among the twelve is chosen to be their head in order to remove any occasion for a division. Against Jovinian 126, A.D. 393. I follow no leader but Christ and join in communion with none but your blessedness, Pope Damasus I, that is, with the chair of Peter. I know that this is the rack on which the church has been built. Whoever eats the lamb outside this house is profane. Anyone who is not in the ark of Noah will perish when the flood prevails. Letters 15, 2, AD, 396. Augustine. If the very order of episcopal succession is to be considered, how much more surely, truly, and safely do we number them, the bishops of Rome, from Peter himself, to whom, as to one representing the whole church, the Lord said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not conquer it. Peter was succeeded by Linus, Linus by Clement. In this order of succession a Donatist bishop is not to be found, Letters 53, 1, 2, A.D. 412. Council of Ephesus. Philip, the presbyter and legate of the Apostolic See, Rome, said, There is no doubt, and in fact it has been known in all ages, that the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, pillar of the faith, and foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to him was given the power of loosing and binding sins, who down even to today and forever both lives and judges and his successors. Acts of the Council, Session 3, A.D. 431. Secnal of Ireland. Steadfast in the fear of God, and in faith immovable, upon, Patrick, as upon Peter the, Irish, church is built, and he has been allotted his apostleship by God, against him the gates of hell prevail not. Him in praise of St. Patrick 3, A.D. 444. Pope Leo I. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Dot, dot, has placed the principal charge on the blessed Peter, chief of all the apostles. Dot, dot, dot. He wished him who had been received into partnership in his undivided unity to be named what he himself was, when he said, You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, Matt. 1618, that the building of the eternal temple might rest on Peter's solid rock, strengthening his church so surely that neither could human rushness assail it nor the gates of hell prevail against it. Letters 10, 1, AD, 445. Council of Chalcedon. Wherefore the most holy and blessed Leo, Archbishop of the Great and Elder Rome, through us, and through this present most holy synod, together with the thrice blessed and all glorious Peter the Apostle, who is the rock and foundation of the Catholic Church, and the foundation of the Orthodox faith, has stripped him, Dioscorus, of the Episcopate. Acts of the Council, Session 3, A.D. 451. Ammon, why Peter is undeniably the rock? 1. Matthew, we have pretty solid evidence, was originally written in Aramaic. Both streets. Papias and Irenaeus tell us as much in the second century. But even more importantly and more certainly Jesus would not have spoken his discourse of Matthew 16 in Greek. Greek was the dominant language of the Roman Empire in the first century 
but most of the common Jewish folk to whom Jesus spoke would not have been fluent in it. Aramaic was their spoken language. Moreover, we have biblical evidence John 1.40 to that also points to Jesus using Aramaic in the naming of Peter. Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon the son of John? You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The name Cephas is an anglicized form of the Aramaic Kepha, which means simply rack. There would have been no small rack to be found in Jesus' original statement to Peter. Even well-respected Protestant scholars will agree on this point. Baptist scholar D. A. Carson, were eyes, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. T. He underlying Aramaic is in this case unquestionable, and most probably Kepha was used in both clauses, you were Kepha, and, on this Kepha, since the word was used both for a name and for a, rack. The Peshitta, written in Syriac of Peter is quite inconceivable. Dot, 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 for there is no reference here to the faith of Peter. Rather, the parallelism of thou art rock and on this rock I will build shows that the second rock can only be the same as the first. It is thus evident that Jesus is referring to Peter, to whom he has given the name rock. Dot, dot, dot. To this extent Roman Catholic exegesis is right and all Protestant attempts to evade this interpretation are to be rejected. For, if St. Matthew wanted to distinguish racks in the text, he would have most likely used lithos. As stated above, lithos could refer to a large rock, but it was more commonly used to denote a small stone. However, there is a third word St. Matthew could have used that always means small stone, suppose. It is used twice in Reverend 2.17 as small stone when Jesus says, To him who conquers I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, with a new name written on the stone which no one knows except him who receives it. Here we have one Greek word that unlike Lithos and Petra always has a connotation of small stone, or pebble. 5. A simpler line of reasoning gets away from original languages and examines the immediate context of the passage. Notice, our Lord says to St. Peter in Matthew 16 17-19, And Jesus answered him, The words simply meant rock or a stone. Craig S. Keener, another Protestant scholar, on page 90 of the I've Bible background commentary of the New Testament, states, in Greek, here, they, referring to Petros and Petra, are cognate terms that were used interchangeably by this period. D. A. Carson points out the big slash small distinction did exist in Greek, but is found only in ancient Greek, used from the 8th to the 4th century BC, and even there it is mostly confined to poetry. The New Testament was written in Koine Greek, used from the 4th century BC to the 5th century AD. Carson agrees with Keener and with Catholics that there is no distinction in definition between Petros and Petra. One of the most respected and referenced Greek dictionaries among evangelicals is Gerhard Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. In a most candid statement about Matthew 16-18, Dr. Oscar Cullman, a contributing editor to this work, writes, The obvious pun which has made its way into the Greek text, dot, dot, suggests a material identity between Petra and Petros. Dot, dot, as it is impossible to differentiate strictly between the two words. Dot, 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 Petros himself is this Petra, not just his faith or his confession. Dot, 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 the idea of the reformers that he is referring to the faith. Few texts have been the occasion for the spilling of more ink than Matthew 16 17-19. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. For Catholics, this text is clear. All twelve apostles were present. Yet Jesus promised to give to Peter alone the keys of the kingdom, symbolizing the authority of Christ the authority of heaven over the kingdom of heaven on earth, which is the church.
Yet millions of Protestants believe that there is a distinction in meaning in the Greek text between the two rocks that would eliminate Peter from consideration for being the rack. Thou art Petros and upon this Petra I will build my church. Dot, dot, the first rock, Petros, is claimed to refer to a small, insignificant rock, Peter. The second, Petra, is claimed to mean a massive boulder, that would be either Jesus or Peter's confession of faith. The argument concludes Jesus did not build his church upon St. Peter but either upon himself or Peter's faith. Below are seven reasons, among many others we could exit, a language cognate with a dialect of Aramaic, makes no distinction between the words in the two clauses. 2. In Koine Greek, the dialect of Greek used by the authors of the New Testament, Petros and Petra are masculine and feminine forms of words with the same root and the same definition rack. There is no small rack to be found in the Greek text, either. So why did St. Matthew use these two words in the same verse? Petra was a common word used for rack in Greek. It is used 15 times to mean rock, rocks, or rocky in the New Testament. Petros is an ancient Greek term that was not commonly used in Koine Greek at all. In fact, it was never used in the New Testament, except for Peter's name after Jesus changed it from Simon to Peter. It follows that when St. Matthew was translating, he would have used Petra for rack. However, in so doing, he would have encountered a problem. Petra is a feminine noun. It would have been improper to call Peter Petra. This would be equivalent to calling a male Valerie or Priscilla in English. Hence, Petros was used instead of Petra for Peter's name. 3. There are several words the inspired author could have used for rock or stone in Greek. Petra and Lathos were the most common. They could be used interchangeably. A connotation of large or small with either of them would depend on context.